with no further ado, I think uh, Professor Ravi uh, Vigo Gomata, please introduce yourself very briefly before you get started. And I believe you have requested that you do your entire 30 minutes. And that's okay because after this, we don't have another presenter, so we can include the questions in the closing session. So let's start with, uh, let's let's right away get started. Thank you. Okay, I'll share my screen also. I'll show yes, my PPT. Good morning to everyone. I'm very happy to be at this uh, conference on Sadeshi Indology. Um, let me just go to share my screen here. Call. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Please. Okay. And on um, screen. Yeah. My name is. Uh, Ravi Gomatam, um, that's my legal name. My spiritual name is Sraj Das. I'm the director of Institute of Semantic Information Sciences and Technology with centers in Berkeley and Bombay. Right now, I'm talking to you from our Berkeley Center. I am also uh, a visiting professor at ICPR for this year. Um, a talk overview, I'll do a Puro Paksha on Pollock, uh, specifically one point is unacceptable characterization of pre-modern Sanskrit. And then I'll introduce a very new idea, which I think will, might be of interest to all of you, a new understanding of the oral tradition. And I will also introduce the idea of sacred Indology, which is basically the same as Swadeshi Indology, unless Swadeshi Indology aims to include both the sacred and secular approaches. But in so far as uh, the Vedic tradition is essentially highly theistic, I think sacred Indology and uh, Swadeshi Indology should be uh, synonymous. And I will give three examples of how sacred Indology would respond to some of the ideas in Western Indology, especially a la Polak. And towards the end, I'll point out that the concept of time is crucial to any Indology. So is the concept of space and objects which are derived, and or at least it's derived the other way. And I'll try to indicate as a build-up for my later Uttara Paksha, sacred Indology's notions are more scientific than the ones that are currently undergirding uh, Western Indology. The main uh, idea of Pollock that I could see in his book, uh, The Language of Gods in the World of Men, is that he's trying to divide the ancient Sanskrits, what I call the sacred tradition Sanskrit, from the postmodern or secular Sanskrit. And then he introduces it in terms of European thought. And uh, for example, the opening sentence of his book says, a great moment of transformation of culture and power in pre-modern India occurred in around the beginning of the common era when Sanskrit, long a sacred language restricted to religious practice, was reinvented as a code for literary and political expression. Look at the word reinvented. The title of the book says the language of the gods in the world of men. So you would think like the sacred tradition, how it got secularized and became temporal would be the theme. But actually, he's going to claim that sacred Sanskrit has nothing to do with this pre-modern Sanskrit. And it's, so it's reinvented, it's completely different. And in fact, the very label, label pre-modern is connecting it to current times. Okay, pre-modern is actually a term in Western philosophy, you know, coming from 17th century onwards. And this kind of introducing Sanskrit, you know, in the pre-modern terms, allows him to link it entirely to 18th century European thought, I'll, as I'll show by a couple of examples. And Pollock doesn't even name the antecedent sacred Sanskrit tradition in his works, and I'll call it the sacred tradition or the sacred Sanskrit tradition. Okay, his first step in, his, in the separation he tries to effect is that he claims that the pre-modern Sanskrit began around the common era. I could find no factual basis for this claim in his book. And to date, everything around the common era is, of course, a British predilection. But the so-called Greek recorded history itself could be a myth. For example, Parmenides, who is presented as an eminent pre-Socratic philosopher, he composed, according to Diogenes, only a single work, a metaphysical and cosmological poem. And that is in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. SCP. And SCP also says the work of Democritus, who is supposed to be the father of Greek atomism, has survived only in second-hand reports, sometimes unreliable and conflicting. 
And atomism is a very much a part of ancient Indian thought. Euclid, famous for his book Elements, is now thought to be largely a fictitious character. Either a group of mathematicians uh, wrote that book, or the book was already present, and it was uh, co-opted by the Greeks. You know, and Pythagoras himself, again, according to Stanford Encyclopedia, wrote nothing. So our knowledge of Pythagoras' views is entirely derived from reports of others. And in Rig Veda, we find in the construction of Yajna Sala, you know, essentially the Pythagoras theorem. Anyways, Greek thought, you know, it seems an argument could be made is actually a subset of ancient Indian thought. Its notion of four elements is a subset of the Sankhya idea of 24 elements. Our atomism actually is much, much deeper and relational as opposed to the objective uh, naturalized idea of atoms the Greeks had. Uh, I, I have a thesis that um, Greek idea is pre-scientific, whereas the uh, Vedic idea is post-scientific. It's relevant for the future of science, and I'll show that towards the end. Same is the idea of Greek gods, Minerva, Zeus, or the medical twin brothers. Pumbuhar is a well-known port in South India where uh, Greek Indian trade uh, thrived 500,000 BC, you know, and it's, it's historical evidence. So the scanty Greek tradition, largely echoing Vedic ideas, has recorded primacy as a part of recorded history. But the Vedic tradition, with its immense range of works, the Vedas, Upanishads, Brahma Sutras, Puranas, Itihasas, Yamalas, etc., have survived intact in their full form and still influence the lives of hundreds of millions of devout Hindus around the world. But that's treated as mythology. You know, it's unreasonable. The second step of the Europeanization of uh, Sanskrit by Pollock is that he introduces the distinction Indian philosophers have drawn between Paramatika and Vyavaharika, and he says it's the same as the, what the 18th century Italian thinker Vico has called Viram and Sirkam. And that's, uh, is this true? Viram, he defines this points to the absolute truth of philosophical reason, and this is a characteristic of Pollock's style, which oftentimes is very dense and also pointless much times, and sometimes it's very sly. He uses the word absolute truth here, which is, of course, a preoccupation of Vedic tradition, you know, Satyam Param, Param Satyam Brahman. But as far as I know, Italian thinkers have never talked of absolute truth. They have talked of philosophical reasoning. So, but he just throws it in like, you know, a few bones for the, you know, Indians. And Septum points towards certitudes that people have at different stages of their history and that provide, provides grounds for their beliefs and actions and workaday truths. This is more like empirical. So he's contrasting the pragmatic empirical truth with philosophical reasoning. And the idea of Septum forms the core of this book. So upon this European view, Paramartika and Vyavaharika go in two different directions, the philosophical and the everyday pragmatic. But according to the sacred tradition, Paramartika and Vyavaharika are not opposed. They both aim for the same, the absolute truth, and the former is for those who embrace Sanyas Dharma, and the later is for those who follow regulated household Dharma. It's a doubt -tailing. So from this viewpoint, the emergence of pre-modern secular Sanskrit need not be due to imagine the emergence of literariness or pursuit of political power as Polar claims. Rather, in the sacred tradition, we would attribute it to the inability of people in general to strictly follow either path Sanyas Dharma, Household and Dharma according to rules, due to the emergence of Kali Yuga. And sacred Indology will put Kali Yuga for 3100 BC. And, uh, and as I grew up, we had used to have Panjangams, which talk about years, not in terms of common era, but in terms of Kali Yuga times. And uh, it will be called 5100 something right now. So this is a very much a part of Indian history. I just want to show you a small video. This is a shot of a house in Sri Viliputur, which is um, you know near Madurai, and here it has got uh, oops um, you know this shows actually a house that very old was lived. So. This person is a 224th generation descendant of Alvar. Very Alvar was a famous Sri Vaishnavite. And the video goes on to show the actual deities that Alvar worshipped 5,100 years ago, start of Kali Yuga. So, you see, this is a living history. 
Merod Palace in Udaipur is supposed to have 800 generations record, and that's about 20,000 years. And they say they're descendants of Kusha, Love Kusha, Ramayana, and that's more than one million years old. And physical evidence is just available all over India. I heard uh, Raju Malhotra make this point, and we should pursue that. In any case, our option is only for everybody whether to follow the Indian myth or the Western myth. The Indian myth, according to them, is all this Yuga cycles, one Chatur Yuga is 4.32 million years, Kalpa a time of Brahma is 4.32 billion, lifetime of Brahma is 311 trillion, he's 51 years old now, so the age of the universe is 1.58 trillion, the age of the earth is 1.96 in this mantra. Myth goes on. Westerners have their own, you know, myth, which is in terms of geological periods, which are also talking in terms of hundreds of millions of years. So the question could be, and they are of the same order as the Vedic ideas, and in fact the Vedic ideas are much bigger numbers. So if modern scientists can actually, using their intellectual power, you know, talk about its universal history, hundreds of millions of years old, why not we consider the testimony of sages who are spiritually more evolved, and who have also given actual universal history? Well. In any case, the Pollock's slate of hand in introducing the idea of pre-modern Sanskrit is that he separates pre-modern Sanskrit from its sacred roots, and then he defines it in terms of European thought. And it's little wonder that he then sees precursor to later day European ideas such as Nazism in pre-modern Sanskrit thought. Whereas actually pre-modern Sanskrit emerges from the sacred tradition, the Vedic Sanskrit, and I am going to talk about the next point that makes this connection um, more strongly, and that is the idea of oral knowledge tradition, which is different from what they call as oral tradition. So according to Paul, our pre-modern is marked by poetry and polity, and he says that the purely oral could not be kavya. There is no basis for this claim offered either. And the sacred tradition, in the sacred tradition, Valmiki wrote Ramayana and Treta Yuga, and uh, he's called Adi Kavi and Ramayana is called Kavya. So the tradition of being oral at that time does not mean that either or before or after there was no writing. Ganesha is known as the scribe of Mahabharata, which was written at the start of Kali Yuga 1500 years ago, which by Indian standard is not too long ago. So I'm introducing to you now a sloka from Srimad Bhagavatam, which actually says that the Sanskrit alphabets were created at the time of creation, material creation. Brahma's soul was manifested as the touch alphabets, his body as the vowels, his senses as the sibilant alphabets, his strength as the intermediate alphabets, and his sensual activities as the seven modes of music. The first thing we should note here is that the letters of the alphabet, they don't have the same ontological standing. And this verse is pretty difficult to understand and Srila Prabhupada has actually contributed immensely to doing sacred ontology in modern times. And he writes in this purport that in Sanskrit there are 13 vowels and 35 consonants. The vowels are a, a, e, e, etc. The consonants are ka, ka, dha, dha. Among the consonants, the first 25 letters are sparshas, and there are four antastas, and there are usmas, kaladya, murdhini, and dantya. That's his purport. Then he makes some very interesting points. The musical notes are sari, gama, padani. All these sound vibrations are originally called Shabda Brahmana, spiritual sound. The Vedas are spiritual sound, and therefore there is no need of material interpretation for the sound vibration of the Vedic literature. The Vedas should be vibrated as they are, although they are symbolically represented with letters which are known to us materially. So very important point, because in this I have, you can see that I have written this sloka in Sanskrit that I have also transliterated in English, and you could read either from the transliteration or from Sanskrit. But actually, neither of them is relevant because the meaning of those sound words is very different from the physical characteristics of the letters themselves. So I want to actually explain that the uh, idea of Sarigama Padani, which is coming in the lowest order of, in the scale of the reality of Sanskrit letters, Classical music, Sarigama Padani, you see, Sa cannot be learned, it can be written down, but it cannot be learned unless you hear it from someone who knows how to say Sa, and it takes many years. I'm kind of an amateur uh, 
uh, classical musician, and it took me 15 years to get some hang on sa. And any classical musician would say that the master sa will take lifetimes. So the point is that uh, music is essentially oral tradition. That even if you are able to write music, ultimately you have to hear from somebody, and you have to actually sing. So that is a similar meaning for Vedic tradition as oral tradition, because it's a knowledge that can only be orally gotten. And there are, in fact, four kinds of priests for Ajna, and one of them is Ugata, who sings the mantras. So the Vedas actually are to be sung. And classic, just like film music is today recognized as a lighter version of classical music, classical music itself is a lighter version of Vedic meters. So the Vedas actually involve sound, which is uh, to be heard and repeated. So the existence of written music sheets doesn't mean learning singing ceases to be oral tradition. Similarly, whether there is written script or not, even today, when we have, when Pola claims we have script, the Vedas have to be oral tradition. And it would have to be heard from Dharma Vikaris, uh, spiritually realized people, who know exactly like music has to be learned by hearing from those who know how to sing. So I think Professor Jha made this point that if Indians are to bring sacred ontology actively into the field of playing, we have to actually take back our sacred tradition seriously in our own lives. In any case, so the Western Indology is talking about the sacred tradition Indology is similar to someone writing about classical Indian music without having ever learned it orally. Pollock and others have actually not learned the you know, Vedic sa uh, sound from authoritative sources, which requires following regulatory principles. Um, Malhotra says that he accept, uh, Pollock accepted that he doesn't follow the tradition, but he tries to do it objectively. And sound in the tradition, sacred tradition, is the first level of matter. Sound is information. This is not sound according to the sacred tradition, it's noise and it can be measured in terms of wavelength. But actual sound is information. There are four qualities of information, para, pashyanti, madhyama, and vaikari sounds. Vaikari is what anybody can speak, and Western Indology is at the level of vaikari sound. Sacred Indology starts at the level of madhyama, and there are two more sounds. And current science minimally transcends vaikari sound. To give an example, if I ask people what is this, they'll say these are numbers. But these are not actually numbers. These are actually symbols for numbers because numbers could be written like this. They could be written like this. And, uh, you know, these are actually, you know, symbols for numbers. So if you Google that topic, what are numbers, you'll be surprised to find that no one knows what they are. Even in modern times, there are four schools in mathematics, uh, platonic realism, conventionalism, brewers, intuitionism, and stuff like uh, Hilbert's formalism, which is the most dominant school. And so this, although we say one, two, three, and sometimes you may think of two apples or three you know, uh, grapes, those are empirical things. And in pure mathematics, these sounds, numbers, they actually have a meaning that can be learned only by knowing pure mathematics. Pollock will dare not analyze pure mathematics in our work, a mathematical paper, just in terms of its written symbols. So, because of this, Pollock is coming to this idea that I do not believe South Asia's contribution is the most important ever merged world knowledge, but we can ask why. If actually sound is the basis of information, and information is, a, you know, the first state of matter, sound is, you know, sabdat and avati, then, and if, if modern knowledge is based on Vaikari sound, and science is trying to move beyond it a little bit, and if Vedic knowledge is actually giving four levels of sound about that, why is it that one should summarily, summarily dismiss South Asia's contribution? You know, it could be the most important ever made to world knowledge. And uh, he's a little bit right about the claims like, you know, recipe for cold fusion in some Vedic text. We would say from sacred ontology viewpoint that uh, the scientific conception of matter in Vedas is very different from modern uh, work. Uh, this is my last but one slide. Uh, sound in sacred ontology will be the first level of matter and its information. 
And uh, currently, there is a huge move in Western science to move from the idea of mass and energy as ontology for matter to information, in fact, semantic information. And I have actually developed an idea called objective semantic information, OSI. It's a new concept of matter. It involves a host of new ideas in science. I've been working on it for nearly 36 years. And it involves many ideas like new empiricism called tandem, uh, the Indian Vedic empiricism, new scientific realism, new mathematics for macroscopic quantum mechanics. That's my special field in physics that I work. And it's replacing Hilbert space, and new notion of biological information, new quantum computing and all. And the interesting point is that all of these are based on the concept of Panchabhutas, Tanmatras, and senses and their interaction. This is therefore a contribution from sacred ontology to science. You know, this would be a very important thing to counter Pollock's ideas that Vedic ideas have no contemporary relevance, they can only be regressive. In fact, contemporary scientists around the world have begun to appreciate it. And here is one sample from a Nobel laureate in quantum physics. But I was very interested in the talk by Dr. Ravi Gomatov because he showed by some nice arguments that the proper way to think of quantum mechanics is in terms of relationships. This is a new way of thinking. It may be that this is how we should be doing science. And the significance of this is that there is a 110-year-old problem in quantum mechanics about the nature of matter that's unresolved. And nearly 28 million PhDs in the West have worked on it. They have not even figured out the problem, forget the solution. And here is Nobel laureate accepting that um, we are doing this work. And many of my papers are now part of the curriculum in North American universities. And this is all based on uh, work that's coming from very you know, tradition. So this is my concluding slide. On winning the battle for Sanskrit, I believe that the first order of the business from the viewpoint of Pollockian Indology is that we have to reclaim the continuity of connection between Vedic Sanskrit and pre-modern Sanskrit. Pre-modern Sanskrit has come from Vedic tradition, has its roots there, not in European thought. And uh, make pre-modern Sanskrit therefore go back to Vedic roots, rather than ask it to be pruned of you know, the Vedic ideas as Pollock claims. And we trace the influence of Kali Yuga on its emergence, and therefore we date it to 3100 BC. And we actually developed sacred Indology on a theistic and scientific basis. And that actually is my principal work. And I believe that this task is one of the most, if not the most important front in reclaiming Sanskrit and Vedic Sanskrit on a modern basis based on science. And these ideas are crucially dependent on developing our own notions of time within science and which also I'm doing. And you can find more information about our work at these two places. And uh, that is my presentation. Thank you. Yes, uh, Dr. Um, Gomatam. Yes. Would you care to uh, answer some questions? Absolutely, I'll be delighted. Anyone? In that case, um, have you considered the um, objection, not just of Pollock, but of very many Indologists, that you know there are proper scientific reasons that even Indians will readily accept for not claiming such extreme chronologies, such as Rama being in the Treta Yuga one million years ago, or even questioning, for example, the start of Kali Yuga with the Mahabharata in uh, 3100 uh, BC. I mean, you, you certainly are aware of the arguments that you see this is really very extreme and that, you know, uh, an India centered Swadeshi Indology can mean many things, but not this extreme and so called fundamentalist. Uh, restoration of these Puranic beliefs in, in extremely long ages. I could not hear you very well, but if I understood your question, you're asking that this timing in terms of Yugas and Kali Yuga starting in 3000 BC, 
will not be taken seriously by Western knowledge. Yeah, not and just by Pollock and his school, but by uh, yeah, yeah. and those okay. so across the all, spectrum. This is a huge topic, and I have just kind of indicated contours of my work, but I could just say this: Pollock, I see no. He's not, I don't think he's scientifically literate. Right? He's not a scientist. And uh, you know, when I, I, I'm, I'm a scientist, I work in quantum physics, and uh, I have many published papers. And the second thing is that we have to reconceive time within science. Few people know that in modern physics, there is no time. What is called time is called parametric time, and the time t is a parameter. It's actually a comparison of two motions. There is opposing to this, there is something called psychological time or felt time, which is the time that you and I feel. But in physics, there's no room for that. It's a mathematical, just like the idea of object in physics as a point particle, for example, is a purely mathematical abstraction. It's a point in the Euclidean space. It is not like the object in the world, because objects in the world have finite extension, but points they don't have. But <coughs> physics is the idea of connecting mathematics to experience. That's a big uh, topic. So similarly, time in experience is not connected in physics except in a very indirect way. But in quantum mechanics, the observations have to be treated as experience, and the time act can be actually talked about in terms of felt time and quantified. So when we introduce this time in felt time within science, you then people like Sheldon Pollock will have no basis for objecting to Vedic time traditions because they are more scientific than the current parametric time. Because the current parametric time has failed in quantum mechanics. For example, quantum mechanics does not have an operator for time. But in our reinterpretation of quantum mechanics and developing a new physics, if we can bring this new concept of time, that's going to be I think a very major argument. I can't give the full details here, Ravichi, but that's the line of my response to your question. I hope I responded. Ravichi, can I ask a question? Uh, the, uh, I find, I've read your papers previously also. I've read your papers previously also. Yes. Uh, and, and I feel that uh, the, the originality and profoundness in the notion of time and how it could reshape quantum mechanics is, is very impressive. Thank you. Uh, but what I want to propose and ask you if it's possible is there's a philosophy of science, ph philosophy of science that you have based yes. on based on Vedic principles. Right. Can this be developed and, and articulated independently of chronology in other words, of course, of course. Okay, so this may address. If you, if you don't do that, if you don't start from the existing science, you don't have a new science. There has to be a connection. That is what I'm sorry to interrupt you, but please go ahead. Yeah, I no, no. I'm saying that to address Conrad's question about the immensely long periods of time in the Puranic chronology. My question is whether that Puranic time scale is a contingency for the, your philosophy of science to work, or whether your philosophy of science has, an, has its own validity regardless of that particular chronology of time. In other oh, words, of course. In, in other it's words, not a contingent idea. It's not a contingent so idea. That, that, that's my, on that, that is correct. So my feeling is that you have two, two things you are saying, and they can be decoupled. And if you were to present your entire thesis with no relationship or dependence on the different yugas purely as what? What? I didn't understand this suppose you what were to, no relationship su suppose you were to hypothetically suppose you were to present your entire uh, philosophy of time yes without any dependence or any contingency on the time scales of yugas suppose would it be valid would would it stand without the puranic time scale being required yeah, yeah, see, Yavanartha Udapane, Sarvata Sampradhotake. What can be obtained from a little well can also be obtained from a great lake, Bhagavad Gita. So, this Vedic viewpoint is a much bigger viewpoint. From this, 
if the Western scientists think that we actually want only an objective conception of matter that does not have any of any appeal to the sacred dimension, you know, soul or God or consciousness and stuff like that. Within that attempt also, they have run into some serious problems about matter and we can help out. And that will actually form the basis to go to the next step above. Yeah, no, I, I, I know that's, uh, I think that's sometimes, part of, let me, let me yeah. just say, uh, I know that I, I have an impression that you once asked me, why is it that in your papers you are not directly talking about the Vedic connection? Because in science first, we have to actually solve some problems in science. Whatever is the deeper viewpoint, they call it as the larger metaphysics. There is always metaphysics in scientific theories. And they actually come automatically later and accepted if the scientific theory is accepted. So right now, there are some issues in quantum mechanics. For example, the Schrodinger education applies to the normal world in which we live. But they don't know how to do it. You can just take it for granted from me. So macroscopic quantum mechanics is now just a nascent field, but I've worked on it for 30 years. So it is in that ordinary lived world of applying quantum mechanics that all these ideas can help. So I can present, for example, Vedic empiricism and scientific realism without reference to Vedas, and it's a must. I should do that in science like that. And later on, we can show the connection. But in this conference, I have gone out of my way and I have tried to show the connections. And the fundamental idea is the idea of sound. All right, one last question. Yeah. Uh, I am V. N. Jha, uh, a retired professor from Pune University. And uh, you said I really? V. N. Jha. My name is V. N. Jha. Yeah, yeah, yes, I know, sir. I recognize you. So I think you attended our 1986 conference in Bombay. <laughs> I have forgotten you remember. <laughs> <laughs> Although the Thanks. picture is very uh, fuzzy, I recognize yeah, thank you. I, uh, uh, for others' information, I organized a conference. Anyway, on I, 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 I appreciate uh, your uh, presentation that uh, there is a no disconnect uh, between Vedic Sanskrit and uh, what you what what we have said pre-modern Sanskrit, Sanskrit, whatever name they give. So I agree with this, but some factual uh, statements are need uh, need to be corrected. Uh -huh. uh, for example, uh, the terms that you have used, the Hota, Udgatri, Advaryu, the terms that you have used need to be paraphrased properly. Hota is not, oh. uh, Hota is not one priest who offers. One who offers is Advaryu. He is uh -huh. the, the leader. And Hota has a function to perform uh, of a different kind. So I think these terms are to be rephrased as per the... Okay, I think uh, whoever entered the text might have just uh, yeah, my jumbled up the things. I'll go back and correct it. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> so this is what I wanted to point out that when you're... Yeah. And... Um, yeah, it's a minor idea, but the main idea is that... And, the, and I also the, agree... Or I also agree with you that you are reading uh, motive uh, in the interpretation of Polo. And I, I agree with that. So thank you very much for... Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Um, Gomatam, I'm afraid we have to stop you just for reasons of time. But yes. Yes, this was a very interesting and ambitious project. Thanks a lot. So we have one question and one response. Okay. Yeah. I'll come to you, Madam. Uh, I'm Vita from Madurai. And uh, yes. I was uh, really happy that you showed the clipping of uh, uh, Andal's Parampara. I visit there yes. very often. And I was uh, really uh, interested in your argument that uh, it is uh, that letters are just symbols, sound is something else. And uh, huh? are you interested I mean, in the argument? Uh, you said one, two, three. These are, these are just symbols. I mean, symbols, right? Yeah. And uh, I again, it is experience that matters, and more than experience, reality check is very important to prove whether Sanskrit is sacred and whether it is alive. And I can give myself as an example because I come from a spiritual tradition. My mother was in the Ramanashram. And I had a guru who said, you be a seeker, you'll find the truth. 
and uh, to me Srimad Bhagavatam came alive I should say and uh, there is a statement e Atamam Prapatyante Tam Sataiva Bajhamyaham so and uh, it, it is not just Sage Shuka but Baraha Peetam again uh, Krishna came alive to me so I am a living example to show that there is no disconnect between uh, our uh, Puranas uh, Itihasas and the present and uh, yeah. I, I want to do a lot of uh, bring in a lot of such experiences to prove that Sanskrit is alive and there is a continuity. In fact, I've traveled extensively from uh, Nepal to Sri Lanka, did the Rama Trail and the Krishna Trail. So I have a lot of uh, personal experience. That's what I want to share. Thank you very much. I just want to make uh, two brief comments on this. Number one, I completely agree with you that the Vedic tradition is experience based. But um, so is Western empiricism. The word empiry in Greek means experience. So empiricism is an ideology. It's like communism. It's experiencism. But the West actually, actually treats experience objectively. What does it mean in an intersubjectively invariant manner? The scientific objectivity is limited to that. And that has led to a lot of science and technology. And it has great currency now. Technology is the opiate of the masses, I say. So in the current, why is it that Shingeri Mutt went to Columbia? Why is the Columbia having such great, because the Western universities, science, you know, that's how science and technology is how they have built their cash value. So unless we enter that field and do better than them in science and technology, using the Vedic frame ideas, this as Professor El said, this is a very ambitious project, but it's not impossible. As I showed you, the Nobel laureate is saying, oh, maybe this is how we should be doing science, because they are stuck. So the point I want to make is that from first person experience testimony, which is very valid, and of course in my own life I experienced that, we have to actually go to presenting Vedic first person experience ideas in an objective manner, and it's possible. That I think is a very, and it's, it can be done in a way without disconnecting it from first person experience. So as current science disconnects first person experience from third person experience called observations. So that disconnect is why in conscious studies you have problem of qualia and stuff like that. So my attempt is to bring it within science that connection back based on scientific um, Vedic thought, but in entirely scientific terms. Okay, that's just a response to. Okay, Dr. Gomatam, you have really made it worth our while to overrule the time constraints. But here we will have to stop. So I thank you. And thank you, Professor Ed. Next time more. We have one. <laughs> no. uh, Professor Gomatam, thank you so much. This was a very interesting lecture. I come from a background in cosmology myself, and hence I found. Yeah, pardon me. I come from a background of cosmology myself. I'm an astrophysicist. A background of what? Cosmology, inflationary cosmology. So, oh, inflationary cosmology. Okay. Yeah, that is why I found your lecture very interesting. Um, Thank you. Two things. Firstly, I completely agree with you that uh, Western humanities and social sciences have still remained largely untouched by even modern scientific theories like even relativity, Einstein relativity itself, or even the concept of time, has not clearly touched Western uh, social sciences and humanities. And you have brought that out very beautifully. I should uh, firstly uh, say that. Because Newtonian time is still what is being considered. That is what forms the basis of the paradigm of Western uh, uh, social sciences and humanities. Secondly, as a student, for me to just uh, you know explore this further. So the main branches you seem to be talking about are quantum information. You're talking about quantum gravity. There is pure mathematics and I would even say maybe cognitive neurosciences. Would you say these are the four? major branches that we have to explore as modern scientists as well as then consider it from the Indian paradigm. Would these be the four major okay. branches or any more? See, because uh, the chair said that already it would take a lot of time and I also couldn't hear your points very well. I would suggest, I'm, I'm very interested because you, you're a physicist, so please uh, send me an email. Uh, one of our, uh, two of our actually institute members are in the audience and Dr. Rajan will talk to you, or Ravindran, and uh, 
you give them your email address and we will be in touch by email and let's discuss sure. this. Thank you. I will do that. Completely hear what you said. I understand. Thank you. I will do that. Thank you. Over to the chair. Yes, uh, so Dr. Govardhan, what is not worth saying three times is not worth saying once. So for the third time, I thank you and uh, we thank enjoyed you. you, your contribution greatly. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.